and welcome to Dear Hank and John. Or as I like to call it, Dear Emily and Hank. It's a comedy podcast for two brothers and sometimes just one brother and a special guest. Answer your questions, give you DVDs, advice, review all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. And today, our special guest host, our guest, not John John, <laughs> is Emily Grassley, the chief curiosity correspondent at the Field Museum in Chicago and host of the Brain Scoop and natural history expert and etc. Emily, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm angry. Why? I have a ang- I have an anger in my soul Why? because um well, Catherine and I uh, a year ago when Oren was 4 months old, we went to the Netherlands and we went to the Kuchenhof Gardens in the, ne- the Netherlands. Beautiful like basically a showcase of all of the best tulip breeders in the world. And it's a beautiful place that sort of makes me marvel at the ability of humans. And we (laughs) bought a bunch of tulip bulbs from the tulip breeders there. I don't think the tulip breeder is the right word, but whatever. Uh, That's what they do. They breed tulips. Yeah. And, uh, And then they sent them to us, and then we planted them. And then after five years of living in this house, suddenly the deer have found us. And they are only eating the Dutch tulips and not any of the normal like Home Depot things we got that are all <laughs> over the yard. But they have selectively chosen to eat the. And maybe this is why. Maybe this is why the Home Depot tulips are the Home Depot tulips. Right. Is, that maybe they're just not as tasty as the good, good. Uh, they're basically like Dutch tulips are like hot dogs to deer. Yeah, Hank, these deer have champagne taste. Like they That's right. they know that you put in all this effort and energy to bring these wonderful tulips back and they think that it's a gift to them. The native deer oh, of Montana. God, is they're, it a gift to them? Is that how I should think of it? Yeah, cuz they can't get on really a plane. Hard. They can't That's go right. get them themselves. <laughs> they're not going to go they have no land bridge that they can take advantage of. So, so I've, I mean, I've been fantasizing about like, because we can, I, I, I think I know when the deer are showing up. They're showing up at like five o'clock in the morning um, uh-huh. because uh, occasionally I'm awake at five o'clock in the morning and I can see that uh, there are no deer prints in the snow and then there are deer prints in the snow. And so I've been thinking about just like hiding in the bushes and then jumping out, grabbing the deer and killing it with my bare hands. But you're saying that I should think of this as if I... Uh, I am doing a, a solid for the deer, and this is part of a, uh, it's part of like a cultural exchange program in which deer get to try new kinds of tulips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all about framing, man. You know, it's just, just reframe the situation <laughs> in your mind. And then you can, every morning, just think, oh, the deer are so grateful. There, look at how grateful they are for what I have done for them. Yeah, yeah, they eat half the tulip and then they move on to the next one because, yeah. uh, you know, they want to try every every individual tulip. Right, and you could say, you're welcome. Oh, you liked the orange ones. Well, me too. So that, that makes two of us now. Well, I don't even know what color they, they are because oh, no. they haven't even gotten to the tulip part of being tulips yet. Uh, They're just I, leaves. I haven't, how are you getting oh. tulips already? We have snow. Oh, we have snow too. There's snow on our tulips. <laughs> Those are some resilient tulips. Well, maybe, I mean, they, they seemed very healthy before the deer ate them. Well, yes. They, a life cut short. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry God. about your deer and tulip problems. Yeah, I don't even know. Like, I don't even feel like the bulbs can come back from this. Anyway, you're probably not too much of a tulip expert. You, you have a number of areas of expertise. But um, but other other than my struggles, are, are things going well in Chicago aside from it not being tulip season yet? Yeah, well, I mean, kind of in that vein, I'm a little, I'm a little sad this week. I had to cancel my vacation that I was going to oh, leave God. for tomorrow because... I had a plan to take a five and a half hour road trip to go witness this giant snake migration in southern Illinois. No, but the high's only thirty eight, and like, and there there will be no snakes in my future. Oh, so the just the you had to cancel the vacation not because of anything to do with you, but to do with the snakes. Like yeah. the snakes aren't going to come out. No, they'll be too chilly. So, but I'm, can't you just wait until it's warm and then go? I can, but you know when you have your heart set on something, it was yeah. gonna be it was gonna be March fifth. I was going to go on this intrepid voyage to to go find a, a migration of danger noodles, and now it's not happening. And did it, you mean April fifth? Just to be clear, yeah. Did, what did I say? May, M- March, March. Yeah, I was I just like, I was like, you got a month, girl. Just chill. No, it was gonna be tomorrow. 
Okay. So, but anyway, my my, oh, I'll we're going in May, so I shouldn't really be that upset about it. I'm just so wait. <sighs> May is a long time from now. Are, is is the, are the Danger Noodles gonna wait that long to come out? Well, I don't are know. They go- are they gonna come out at all? I, like, just you should just have somebody down there, like like waiting, or like a nest cam set up so <gasps> that you can be like, oh, there we go. Let's go. Let's go now. 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 It's yeah, happening. Yeah. 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 Like what they like, kind of what they do with the uh, the the blossoms, the cherry blossoms in D.C. I need like an indicator tree version of that for a snake. Yes. But uh-huh. it should be a person who has my cell phone who can call me at a moment's notice and be like, Emily, danger noodles. And I'll... Emily, my Emily, my clothes are covered in snakes. Yeah. Emily, they're everywhere. Emily, they're inside of my mouth. I'm dying. <laughs> Emily, Emily, there's a there's a venomous snake r- coiled around my legs, and I need medical attention. Maybe that's not how that should go. <laughs> they're they're so hungry. They're eating each other. Oh God, it's the humanity. But at least there's no snow. So come on down. Yeah. Um. So that sounds very cool. Yeah. Uh, are, but the snakes are going to be okay. They're not like in bad shape. No, I think they'll be fine. They're just going to probably wait to come out. So so they kind of, from what I understand, I've never actually witnessed this great snake migration. There's like a, a limestone or sandstone shelf in this national park where a bunch of them overwinter. And then it starts to warm up and they're like, hey, it's time for me to make some snake babies. And then they all kind of come out of these cliffs and start to disperse, and they just happen to all cross this one road that they've actually oh. renamed Snake Road. So, th- so we were going to go down to Snake Road and just hang out and just watch the snakes come across and the road. And they are venomous, like they're they're nasty. There, well, there are, there are a number of species. So there are garter oh. snakes, there are green snakes, there are cottonmouths, there are rattlesnakes. So it was going to be wow. a whole smorgasbord of of danger noodles and just regular noodles, frankly. <laughs> Danger noodles and cuddle noodles. Yeah, and and little boops, you know, just everything, <laughs> just everything happy. Do snakes eat snakes? Because it feels like if you just overwintered and you're like, well, there's a whole lot of snakes around, and some of them are quite small. Yeah, I, I mean, could just chomp that. I I, kind of, I think about that sometimes when snakes eat things with legs, like that creates some some protrusions, right? Right. Yeah. And, so if you can you just eat another snake, it's just like eating a noodle. It just goes down easy. So why not? Well, yeah, yeah. It's like putting it's like putting a cup into a, a larger cup. It just fits right in. Yeah, it's, it's like, like a hole all the way down. Like a Russian nesting doll of snakes. Snakes right, all the way down. Because maybe that maybe that snake had eaten the snake earlier, and you ate the snake, and because you're a snake, and it's just yeah. And then you end up in a museum and someone's like, oh, we have a boa constrictor. And then they're like, no, we don't. We have a boa constrictor that ate another snake that ate another snake. Yeah. And it's like a turducken, but it's just snakes. Yeah. I feel like this is not offering any dubious advice to <laughs> anybody. No. no. I mean, you gave me dubious advice for the, the deer, and I appreciate that. It's all about my mindset more than uh, how to prevent the deer from eating the tulips. That's very, very good. Very dear Hank and John of you. Yeah. Do you have a poem for us, Emily? I do. Um, and the, the funny thing is when I thought about bringing a poem, I realized like abundantly how not well read I am when it comes to poetry. <laughs> and oh I was yeah, like, no, oh, I'm there with you. Shel Silverstein, yeah, 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 I'll get that. Um, but but I thought I'd be a little bit more sophisticated, so I asked a friend of mine if, if they knew of any poems about animals, because I like animals. And so I have one from Lord Tennyson called The Eagle a Fragment. And, and this mm. is how it goes, it's six lines, it's very short. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands, ringed with the azure world he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls, he watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt, he falls. Oh. Mm. Isn't that, that's kind of neat. I'm into animal poetry, that could, be, that could be a thing I could get into. Yeah, he did another one called The Kraken, and that's 15 lines, but we can save that for, another, for the future, but that one is also <laughs> very just, good. You guys, could, everybody could just go look it up and tell Emily what you think of The Kraken. Yeah, that one's got a little bit more drama, so highly recommend it. All right. Well, and now we have entered into the portion of the podcast that is the podcast part of the podcast where we answer questions uh, and try to give some dubious advice. And the first person that we're going to do that for is named Karina, who asks, Dear Hank and Emily, is it selfish to want to be cremated? Since you're not really going back to nature and stuff, would I contribute to the planet somehow by just being turned into ash? Pumpkins and penguins, Karina. Uh, I think that we, like, okay, Emily, what do you know about burial processes? 
Uh, well, uh, a little bit more than I than I knew before I was on YouTube. Actually, Be, there's so mm. there's this great creator named Caitlin Dowdy. She's got a, a YouTube channel uh, called Ask a Mortician. She is, in fact, a mortician. And uh, one of the things that she really advocates for is for green burials um, and all sorts mm-hmm. of like different ways of sort of disrupting the the burial industry. So she's kind of a she's a disruptor, I would say. Uh, totally. And, and uh, so she's illuminated a lot of uh, new ideas for me about how one can return to the earth. And you can like you can be buried in Joshua Tree. So like that's a lot. Like that's people like it's open. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a permitting process. There's an application process, and I think it's there. I mean, there are limited numbers of spaces, but increasingly there are more and more of these green burial opportunities cropping up with people thinking like, well, why don't you just instead of injecting me with formaldehyde and all these preservatives, you know, just let me decay naturally in like a cardboard box or, or like a birch box mm-hmm. or something. And then like plant a tree. And then when I die, you, all of my bits can go back to the earth and nurture bugs and stuff. And, and then I'll just turn into to fertilizer and then there will be a, a healthy tree. And I think right. that's absolutely the, uh, what a, a wonderful holistic way of thinking about it. Yeah, I, I mean, the thing, Karina, to note is that the traditional way of being buried, you don't become that useful because there are, you do sort of get preserved. Um, eventually, you get, you know, like all your, you know, it, it happens, but like the, the process is very slow when placed inside of a very processed, uh, lacquered hardwood box, and inside you yourself have been filled with a lot of things that are designed to make you not decay and uh and uh, like that's the whole goal is to make you not is to make the the make you it, look like you you're still be, alive yeah to make you not be fertilizer um and i like i do i think this is a very personal decision for every person um i think that there is something uh good about cremation in in that like you're just not taking up a lot of space um, you get to sort of go where, like, a place that you like without needing a permitting process. I don't think that anybody needs a permit to just get scattered somewhere. Um, also, burial at sea. Uh, we we d- discussed that on a dear Hank and John once, and you do uh, in a lot of places have to get a permit to be buried at sea. But it is a thing that you can do, which I did not realize. It's pretty amazing. Um, th- I think, yeah, I think that we uh, have too rigid an, uh, rigid an idea of what. Uh, yeah. Post life uh, disposal looks like, and uh, and I'm excited for people who are trying to think about that in different ways. Yeah, I mean, it's like we there are logistical space problems with everybody. Mm-hmm. If everybody who has ever lived or ever will live is going to be, not, in addition to this being like pretty unaffordable for most people, like going into a coffin and then into a cement block mm-hmm. in the ground, like we'll, we're just going to run out of space. So yeah, well, there's a, I I listened to a 99 percent invisible about this recently. It was very good, in which uh, it is discussed that it is kind of a uniquely American idea that you get your burial plot forever. That you, like this is where I rest, and I will be here until the sun explodes. Yeah. I guess. Um, in other places, you lease it, and like when you like when you or your family stops paying the lease, they just. Put somebody else down there. Uh, that makes far more sense. Yeah. Because like, then, it, like 200 <laughs> years from now, someone's going to show up and be like, well, I guess I could have put my grandma here, but there's someone here that we don't really remember. No, and nobody's, I don't know. So I, I nobody's think coming. Nobody's coming by. Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. do you really need this space right now? Right. You don't have any. Vi- you, and that's like that. We don't want to think about that that time eventually when people aren't thinking about us anymore. But that doesn't mean that we didn't have an effect on the world, and that effect doesn't ripple on through people who don't remember us. Emily, do you have any other questions for us? Yeah, uh, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think there are lots of thoughtful ways you can think about what is going to happen with your body. I kind of, you know, people have asked me would I be taxidermied. I feel like that's no. I don't want to go there. No. But maybe an anatomy lab. I will not. Yeah, that is. People have done that. I think I can't remember. Some philosopher is taxidermied at some f- famous school in England, and I'm just like, no, no. And he's like, I don't know if he's on display, but he used to be at least. And I, I just, 
No thanks. There's an, an anthropologist who passed away. I think he he was he's taught at University of Oregon or somewhere in Oregon, somewhere on the West Coast, and he also was a big Bigfoot believer. And I don't know why that's important to the story. (laughs) Anyway, he ended up meeting some anthropologists at the Smithsonian in D.C. And he had kept all of his his Irish wolfhounds when, like, all of their remains after they had passed away because he also was a big fan of Irish wolfhounds. Anyway, long story short, he... When he died in his will, he wanted to be have his skeleton articulated with one of the skeletons of his beloved dog, and and now they're still on display, and you can go see him with his his giant dog with its its doggy paws on his skeletal shoulders, and there it is at the Smithsonian. Ah, well, good. What's his name? I don't remember, <laughs> but <laughs> if you if you Google Smithsonian skeleton greyhound dog it'll probably mm-hmm. come up it's a greyhound or irish wolfhound oh irish wolfhound jeez i'm okay. i'm not getting my dog breeds anyway <laughs> i'm looking yeah his name is grover krantz and there he is that's a big dog it, it is a big dog it's a good boy too yeah he's being a real good boy yeah so oh that's cute yeah i i kind of i kind of like that i wouldn't mind that okay <laughs> yeah yeah more of a yeah you wouldn't mind being an articulated skeleton. You don't like the idea of being taxidermied. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree just... with you deeply. I don't know why that that feels so very different to me, but it does. Okay, this ne- this question's from Emily. Dear Hank and Emily, how do you throw away a trash can? Do you put it into <laughs> a bigger trash can? What about the big ones you put by the side of the road? Are trash cans just immortal? One of many, Emily. I feel oh, like wow. this. I feel like yeah, this really of... goes into the the conversation we just had about snakes eating snakes. <laughs> well, and also, uh, what do you do when you die? What do you do with your trash can when it dies? Right. <laughs> I'm sensing a theme. Yeah, we. You need to. You need to uh, respond. Like, take it to Joshua Tree, bury it three feet down, not so deep that it won't decompose. Yeah. No. But put a plant a tree on it, um, <laughs> and then put a snake in it. I don't know. Uh, I, <laughs> I had this problem recently. Actually, I had uh, like a like one of the metal garbage cans oh. that rusted out the bottom, and uh, and I put it into a larger trash can, and the trash people took it out and put it next to the trash can, basically to say, no, 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 you are doing that wrong. Oh. And I was like, but I don't know how to do it right, so it's just uh, in my garage. So is it, could it be a recycling? Could you put it out on recycling day, maybe? Uh, well, would they take it, it then? As, uh, may, maybe. I would assume, like, it's a hunk of steel. Like, it's got to be useful to somebody, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, it, it, what's wrong with it? It's the bottom, the bottom's all rusted out. Oh, oh, you said that. I was going to say, I have giant aluminum cans full of bird seed in my backyard, so I was like, mm-hmm. you've put bird seed in it, but if the bottom doesn't work, then it's not functional. You know, maybe you should put it out like upside down so that they can they can see that the utility of this particular object right. yeah. has Look, expired. See, it's, it's, it's broke. That's yeah. what I, that's what I was fact, going to suggest to Emily is like, you, maybe you need signage there. Right. Yes. In fact, this WikiHow article suggests putting the trash can upside down. And then if that doesn't work, putting a sign on it that says... Uh, discard or please take this or this is broken have a nice day I hope that things are going well uh, with your family <laughs> the wiki how article says that yeah and then the, the final option if that doesn't work is to cut the trash can up with a saw and kitchen knife <laughs> and put it into a bag I feel like that was more of like that was someone's final attempt and they're just frustrated and they're like I can't <laughs> handle it and then they just angrily go to the garage and get a chainsaw and start hacking it up yeah. and then it ends up working yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like time for the machete. Yeah, uh, and then they also suggest uh, recycling it if you can figure out how to do that. Um, so probably that's what I will end up doing uh, is figuring out how to recycle it because it is, I think, a j- big hunk of good steel. Why yeah. not? Someone could use that. Yeah, melt it down. Yeah, you got to turn turn it into something else. Make it into a birdhouse. I don't know, metal birdhouse. Sure, Some, something. It, put put your snakes in it. I don't know. Yeah, protect your tulips with it. Yeah, yeah, make a, you could hammer it out real thin and hand make some 
chicken wire. Maybe I should protect my tulips with it. Maybe I should just like stake it down onto the ground around my tulips and the deer won't be able to get in and then like some sunlight will get in the rusty bottom. But then they like the sna- the deer will be like, I'm gonna try to get my head in there. And then it's like, nope, rusty edges, not yeah. happening. Oh man, see, Hank, you're still thinking about it like like it's not a gift to the deer. Now, now you're making an obstacle course. I am, I don't, I mean, I feel like I don't, f- yep, that's correct. I want to see my tulips. I want my wife to be happy about the tulips that we have. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I also want Catherine to be happy with, with the tulips. So, the tulip situation. The tulip okay. situation. Okay. Well, if anybody has any suggestions for how I can uh, deal with these deer without uh, without murder, uh, please let me know. <laughs> This next question comes from Nat, who asks, Dear Hank and Emily, I recently moved in with my partner. It's both of our first times living with significant others, and it's scary and weird and exciting and really amazing. The advice I've been given pretty much has all been compromise is key, which has proven to be true. However, a situation has presented itself that I don't know how to compromise on. He doesn't organize his books in any particular order on the bookshelf. He says he does not feel a need to do this. Do I organize it for him? Do I ask him to do it? Do I move out and end our relationship? <laughs> this message transmitted on 100% recycled electrons, Nat. I I feel like this went to a very extreme solution without Well, without I mean it could have it could have she could have thought maybe like let's just burn the whole place down. Let's just Yeah. Like do I we just I think maybe uh books shouldn't exist anymore. Let's end it all. Yeah, but humanity isn't worth saving. There's a very simple solution here that that isn't real. I mean, it is sort of a compromise. It's not even much of a compromise. Why don't you just have your own bookshelves? So that I don't know that that will save the worry here. There may be some amount of like um I can't have a not organized bookshelf in my home. Oh. See it's, it, well, but she does say the bookshelf. Um, and, but also it may not be a place that is big enough for more than one bookshelf. Uh, but yeah, it says the bookshelf, which I assume, uh, I assume that means you're sharing a bookshelf. And to me, yeah, I think Emily, you're right. Either two bookshelves or just organize the bookshelf. Or yeah. Or you just have your own shelf on the bookshelf, right? How many books are we talking right, here? Right. I don't, well, I don't, I don't know. But, but I also think like organize your, your boyfriend's books. That's okay, right? I I, I wouldn't I'd, mind if mm. like if if to me my bookshelf is in no particular order. That means I don't care what order they're in. So if they're in an order, that is equal to me as there being no order. Oh, I I just I feel like just to each its own, right? I mean, if you if, if he's fine with not having books organized, then you just organize your books and just let him have his books be disorganized. Cause that's part of who he is. As a person, someone who does not care about the organization of their shelf. I mean, I guess, yeah, to your point, if it doesn't matter one way or another, then there's no loss. But th- this is also coming from, so my my partner and I have very, we have our own bookshelves because we cannot stand the way that the other one organizes their books. Really? And in fact, yes, oh God. you know, he has made his own book plate. So he's so he's so particular oh, wow. about about making sure that his his books have his name in them that he has his own stamp made and I, and that's fine because it actually so then I don't have to stamp my books I just know that the unstamped books are mine and the stamped books are his also they're all on his bookshelf his books because we we don't we don't uh, we don't share our books on one another's right. shelves it's very rigid he's his is very rigid and yours is less rigid your systems. I, I think, yeah. I mean, because I don't, again, I don't really care. My books are all over the place and and yeah. I don't put my name in them, but. <laughs> I mean, I do, like, if you are merging book collections and it's uh, not, a, and it is a relatively early uh, relationship, I would suggest a certain amount of labeling might be good or some, some system of knowing whose books are whose. We, Catherine and I, for a long time, had a lot of two copies of the same book because our collections merged and we were like, well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know where this is going. Like maybe someday we're going to want to have 
my copy and your copy. <laughs> it's like like three years into marriage before we were like, you know, we probably don't need two copies of this book. Yeah, you probably will we'll probably add any. It's safe to say at this point that <laughs> yeah. we, unless both that of we, us need the same book at the exact same time, that you could probably, probably, yeah. you know, just hit that hit yeah. that level if of we're commitment. Gonna have to, if we're gonna have to divide the books up, there's gonna be bigger things to deal with. That won't that won't be the main concern, right? Yeah, but but um, you're right. I mean, that's kind of a at an early point of a relationship. What like Nat, who had just moved in with their partner, you know, that mm-hmm. is that's a, that's a big commitment. I don't know if that's a conversation that that maybe they're ready to have yet. Yeah, I I organize my books by sort of kind of book like I have a science fiction section and a graphic novel session and I like a young adult section and like nonfiction but it like it, within those sections is basically wherever I put the book I don't feel like I have enough books to need to do it differently than that really I I organize my books by how much I liked them what so that's awful like yeah. but like what if somebody comes over and that that wrote one of the books? Well, that uh, if I and they'll be it, like, <laughs> oh, interesting. My book is uh, at the bottom right. What's well, they, uh, why is it? What, what's your ordering system? Well, it should also go hand in hand. Sort of like the, the the books that I really like usually are from people that I also know. So I I can't imagine a scenario like maybe the the author of. Uh, of the biology textbook fifth edition that is on the bottom <laughs> shelf of my bookshelf. Maybe at some point they will take offense to to the fact that I have put the textbook yeah. on the bottom shelf. But I, I don't see that happening. Um, for instance, you know, you know, John's books are on the top shelf. Because if John came okay. over, I'd be like, look, John, your books, they made right. it. They made it. Here they are. I, I enjoyed them. Yeah, like my, uh, yeah, I, I, that is also, my, my chemistry textbook is also on the bottom shelf, sitting there being like, you know, maybe someday you might need this. You don't know. Yeah, but you're like, it's probably not going to be, I mean, the internet exists. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, when I was writing Crash Course Chemistry or like working on Crash Course Chemistry, I, I did open that book a bunch, but it's been a while since I did that. Yeah. So the utility um, isn't quite there. But I, yeah. I do it because if someone comes over and they're like, hey, I, ne- I need a book to read, it's just easy for me to go, oh, pick one on the top shelf. They're all good. Right. The just, ones on the, it's the top shelf books. Yeah. Yeah. The, the high, that's got to be high, the name of a bookstore. Top shelf. You know, that's not, that's a, that's a good idea. Top shelf books. Uh, yep, it is. It's a virtual bookshop. What? How does that work? Yeah. There's not even a physical sh- top shelf. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> well, I mean, if it was an actual bookstore and only the books on the top shelf were any good, or there were only books on the top shelves, that would just be a huge waste of space. That's true. Well, maybe there's a cafe taking right. up the the other spaces. All the other space, yeah. Anyway. Um, hit, hit me with another question, Emily. Okay. Uh, this one's from uh, Elizabeth with, with an S. Dear Hank and Emily, my best friend <laughs> raises pet chickens in Seattle while being a badass woman. Can we say badass? Yeah. Okay. While being a badass woman in computer science. We Skyped yesterday and our chickens are teenagers. Ugly teenagers. I know we all have awkward phases, but I was wondering <laughs> which animals, in your esteemed dubious opinions, have the worst adolescent awkward phase. Any awkward chicken phases in your lives? Not your mayor, Elizabeth Mayer, with an uh, ER. I mean, okay. I want to see some awkward teenage chicken, so I've Googled that. Awkward teenage chicken. I think they're oh, actually yeah. delightful. Those are cute. They're like almost, well, it's the thing where they're like, they still got their chick fluff, but then they're getting feathers. Uh-huh. And it's like, oh, you look like, I don't know. You look Oh, that is weird. Well. That is You awkward. look not well. <laughs> it, they kind of look like they've, like they've been in a windstorm. Mm-hmm. Because the yeah. fluff is still there, but there are some other real feathers coming. I mean, it's exactly what I look like in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> like like you'd been through a windstorm. Yeah, exactly. And but it kind of had weird <laughs> long legs and looked a little frazzled on top. Right. Yeah. No, I think that that is generally the uh the, Catherine was saying on Delete This our our podcast last week that uh there's sort of a phase that you go through when you just turn into a bunch of noodles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, and like your like your arm like your arms end at your knees, and it's like, what's happening? Yeah. Why did this happen? And your Why? feet are like you skis. And so you just kind of you do you you're like one of those the, those wind dudes outside of car dealerships, yeah. just constantly yeah. getting blown around. Like I don't know what to do with my appendages. Yeah, yeah, and like and then just breaking things, uh, yeah. both both inside and outside of your body. There's a there's a lot of damage happening. Damage occurs, uh, and which made me think that the most awkward uh, juvenile animal I've seen. Is maybe a a young giraffe, which is just all oh. all made of knobby wiggles. Yeah, yeah. There's just like a tiny little nucleus of a body, and then the rest is just <laughs> sticks everywhere. <laughs> like so much going so on. So many sticks. So, uh, but so cute though. Yeah, the, the, the awkwardness is pretty endearing at that level. I was thinking the worst adolescent awkward phase is probably also. I should preface this that it's it's kind of gross, but it's true. Maggots. maggots. Oh gosh, Emily. <laughs> what, I, what, <laughs> what is the, what is the juvenile? Aren't the maggots the juvenile phase themselves? Yes, and and they get such oh, a okay. bad rap because if you because they're just baby flies, and if you if you think of a, a baby fly, then you know there's something maybe endearing about that terminology. But mm. I, I, there's a double standard here, Hank, and it's because people love caterpillars, which are the right, right. The adolescent stages, little wormy bits just the, of butterflies. Yeah, just a maggot butterfly. Yeah, yeah. And, but but people give fly babies a bad rap. And I'm just, uh, I'm thinking of double standards here. That's great. It's, it's a great point. And I mean, the thing, uh, the thing of it is, it, like, it's not like they grow up and they become beautiful, majestic creatures, though. Like, I agree that I'd rather, like, be in the presence of, well, I... Uh, of a butterfly rather than Which, a fly. <laughs> no, no, of a maggot. Like, what would I prefer to be hanging out with? Like, 20 maggots or 20 flies? I don't know. At least the maggots are staying in the same place, mostly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think flies are, are kind of inherently beautiful, too, especially if you see some, like, nice macro photography. But that also requires sure. that they are still and usually dead. Uh, oh, interesting. So I, I'm just, I, you know, personally, I'm also like not a gigantic maggot fan. I think it's because of the, the quantity of numbers in which they're usually found. Mm-hmm. Like a little, they're like, because if you found a bush with like 3 million caterpillars on it, that's also kind of disturbing. Right, yeah. Well, at least now we get to know that, uh, but, that caterpillars are ruined for everyone now that I <laughs> have the phrase butterfly maggot in my head. <laughs> I, I I had very strong opinions about this when I first read that question, and I didn't exactly articulate them out loud. And now that I've gone down this route, I'm I'm I regret it a little bit. I mean, yeah. I well, I think that I think that all larval forms are a pretty awkward adolescent phase, um, and I they're sort of like the quintessential awkward adolescent phase in uh, in children's media because it's always like the the. Caterpillar is very hungry, and he gets a stomach ache, and then he's a beautiful butterfly. Is the is the story? God, that I wish that I had happened to me. To Oren. It did. Look at you. You used to be a windswept noodle, and now you're <laughs> Emily Grassley, host of the Brain Scoop. But I'm still hungry, Hank. I'm always hungry. <laughs> oh right, yeah. You didn't stop being hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, but what, are there any other animals that have awkward teenage? I feel just like it, it's a really uniting. It's, a, mm-hmm. it's something that it's, unites all of us. Yeah, teenagerdom is a really uh, a really interesting uh, phase of awkwardness. I think that dogs have really great awkward teenage years. Oh, so good. So good. So, do you do you go on the subreddit Blunder Years? No, Blunder oh. Years is good. Oh, that's Hank, a good thing. It's so good. It's it, so it's it's just for people who don't know. It's Blunder Years and kind of like Wonder Years, but it's just pictures of people from their most awkward points of their life ever. It's <laughs> it's amazing. This subreddit brings me so much joy. Uh, yeah, I mean the the nice thing about like when I was that age, I didn't r- realize how awkward I was. I didn't know it. 
No, and that's like the beauty of it is like you're so blissfully unaware of yourself mm-hmm. in context of your surroundings, of you know your, your self expression isn't quite on point, and and you just don't even know until ten years later and you look back and you're like, oh dear. Why did my mother let me walk out of the house like that? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I uh, as as a father now, I think about like I will just have to let him walk out of the house like that. There's nothing. There's nothing else I can do about that. No, I, like you can't control them. No, no, and you don't even want to because I think at that point, if someone's if they're not even listening to you right like there's maybe that angsty teenage phase that I think mm-hmm. many of us have been in you just kind of like you know what fine just go j- you just you can you can recoil in disgust at yourself 10 years from now when you see your picture on the top <laughs> page of blunder years and I I will just look forward to that moment and it's all fine <laughs> like the top the top the top picture right now is this kid who covered himself in armor made out of connects. <laughs> I mean that's a win though. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's truly delightful. Okay, right. okay, Emily. This next question comes from Anra, who asks, Dear brothers, and also Emily, I took a summer class on ecology and we had a class on invasive species. My question to you is this, are humans invasive species? If humans are, should we have global regulations on our movements? I know that there's not a way for this to actually happen, but your podcast is pretty nebulous, so I thought you were the best people to talk this out. <laughs> so I thought you were the best people to talk this out. All the best, even in death, Anra. All right, Emily, are humans an invasive species? I have lots of thoughts, go. Oh, but this question makes me so uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> because, uh, I, no, yes. Yeah, 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 no, yes. Yes. It really, yeah, it deeply depends on the definition. What I've learned from living in Montana is that invasive species um, is an ecological term that is, uh, is understood mostly in terms of economic impact. So we talk about invasive species, uh, particularly ones that, like, cows can't eat. Um, that's a big problem. When you have a species that a cow is like, nope, I'm incapable of digesting that, they become very comfortable on the rangeland, and then suddenly you have lots of plants that are not nourishing your cattle, and you have uh, you have land that is less economically productive than it once was. Same thing with, like, zebra mussels that cling to boat propellers and hydroelectric systems, and you have to scrape them off and turn off the, the dam for a little while while you do that, and it results in lost money. So... In this weird way, it turns out that we the, this this ecological problem that we understand and we discuss through an ecological lens. In reality, when we talk about it, it's a human economic problem that we actually when we actually sort of are working and spending money trying to fix it. I never thought of invasive species in that way. Yeah, it's totally like like living in Montana. You start you get a real good look at that. Uh, if you if you pay close enough attention, because yeah. it's really all about rangeland and uh, yeah, and not about like preserving the, eco- the the ecological diversity of a place. Right, and that's I mean that's really interesting because when I think about invasive species, I think there are a lot of like ideological, you mm-hmm. know, things that we can the, these Narnias that don't exist, these gardens right. of Eden that are never going to return to a pristine habitat, and mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. by wanting to eradicate everything that's quote invasive about it is really just sort of like a colonial ab- approach to. Uh, right. to an environment. And so I feel really uncomfortable with the idea that someone could say that humans are an invasive species because then what, where where are we and where are we supposed to go? Right? <laughs> who, who, are we, who are we displacing or who, right. who are we advocating for the displacement of? And I really don't like that way of thinking about it. Right. No, I, like I told, yes, it's a, um, and it's also uh, I mean, the entire idea of an invasive species of of exotic invasives, like these, this doesn't happen 
I mean, it does, but it, it almost always happens because of human intervention. And of course, there is something different about people that is different from nature. But the way that I tend to think of it is not like, okay, you have this box over here that is human, and you have this box over here that is nature, and you have technology, and you have the biosphere, and they are sort of like opposing but very separate spheres, is I uh, have... I have been able to understand it and like keep this like sort of an internalized understanding that I don't have to like refresh in my brain. It just like, it stayed with me Hmm. that the biology is in us and we have this extra stuff on top of it. Um, But like the biology will never come out of us. And, and technology is a biological product in the same way that biology is a chemical product. And uh, and just like we have like chemistry inside of us, we have biology inside of us, we have evolution inside of of us. Like that is all part of our story and who we are. And uh, and I think that there can be this weird like purity argument that comes out of our feelings about nature uh, that is really kind of fake. And yeah that that stuff is always changing and it's always in disruption. And in fact, what we find in ecology is that disruption actually is like not just the natural state, but also where a lot of diversity comes from and that you don't have like single, like wide swaths of old growth forest. You have mixes and meshes and that mixy bit, like where it's not the same everywhere is actually where the most interesting nature happens. Yeah, I think there's a lot of really interesting things too that are happening with, especially with science communication about how you know, certain things have in the past been demonized in a way that isn't necessarily fair. So if you think about like bacteria, right? It's mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you, mm-hmm. there's a big proponent to have everything germ free, which is ter- ter- you don't not want to be germ free. No. Like ger- germs are your friend, number one. And two, we did a video about this a uh, couple of months ago, but um, the ecological importance of parasites. I think there's there's a tendency mm-hmm. to want to eradicate any idea of anything living and feeding off of you or your livestock or anything, but it, it turns out that, like, parasites are kind of like the ne- – they're necessary in a way that a microbiome is necessary. And so I think it's kind of a fun way of looking at the world if you if you imagine not that there's anything pristine to aspire to, but more understanding, like, what the role of everything is currently playing in the current structure and having a curiosity about that. So I don't mm-hmm. know. That doesn't really go back to the question about are humans an invasive species, I guess – Technically, maybe, but also, is it helpful to think about humans as invasive species? Because I'm not sure that it is. Right. Yeah. I mean, I it, it understanding an accurate understanding of of the relationship between humans and the biosphere is very hard to like. I don't think that there is one. I don't think that there is like one right way of thinking about it. Um, but yeah, I think that the the thing that's necessary that has been necessary for me is an appreciation of humans and a a sort of like amazement at them in the same way that I have awe and amazement at the biological systems and to to appreciate both of those things um and know that like yes one of them feeds off of the other more than the other feeds off of it but um but you know we uh are remarkable and I want to continue thinking and I can I, I, like I think objectively that like humans are extremely interesting and uh oh, and yeah. very cool and and that that it, it's almost like thinking you know like the geology of the earth would be more pristine if there weren't so many animals on it and I'm like <laughs> okay <laughs> but like but like you don't want no animals they're awesome right also, yeah, like, um, what, what about the fossil so. record? Like, the fossil record is just the gift <laughs> yeah, that yeah. keeps on giving yeah. when you're like, wait. Yeah, no, totally. What happened to the Cambrian? This is crazy. This is crazy. All right, I want to do one more question before we get to the news from Mars and AFC Wimbledon, and I would like you to ask this question about salt because I think it feeds into this conversation we're having. Yes, this is from, from Tessa. Dear Hank and Shrimp and Emily, I guess, uh, <laughs> I'm a big fan. Did you of the- have do you do you have an adolescent nickname because that was John's adolescent nickname? Oh oh my adolescent oh god my adolescent nickname was um, Emily P. And I oh, it, I mean that's not a good nickname. <laughs> um, but it, that, but it, it's the truth, which is what matters, right? And it, I hated it, and my sister insisted on calling me Emily P. 
Um, and I don't know why, and but it always bothered me. And so she kept doing it because that's what older sisters do. Um, mm, perfect. So dear Hank and Emily P., uh, <laughs> I am a big fan of the pod and in need of your dubious expertise. I recently started thinking about salt, namely sea salt, and why people always make a big deal about it being sea salt. Doesn't all salt come from the sea? I realize that actually, maybe since salt is a mineral, it's also possible to extract it from the ground. How does that process work? And do we use all kinds of salt in our food? Why is sea salt seen as the best and most luxurious of all salts? Many (laughs) thanks in advance, Tessa. I like the luxurious because it is like that's it's a weird thing that like we've created this like this marketing machine around a type of salt to be like it's not just salt it'll taste salty yeah no it'll taste like salt but <laughs> but it's, it'll just like it's more expensive so it's probably better right th- I mean this is this isn't just sea salt I honestly Hank and Tessa I kind of think that sea, sea salt is a little 2015. I feel like right, right yeah, now the, moved on. the rage is gray salt and Himalayan pink salt, even though I would also say Himalayan pink salt is more 2017 than anything. Oh, and now there's gray salt. What's What the frick is gray salt, Emily? I've never heard of this. Hank, get this. It's salt that happens to be gray. But I, why? I is it gray know. because they put like extra money in it so it costs more? Uh, or maybe it's just dirty and they're like, you know what? <laughs> We are going to save a bunch of money by not having to clean this salt. So, and but we'll we'll just market it as gray salt, and people eat it up literally. Uh, gray salt. So, uh, I I'm look I'm looking up gray salt right now. Oh God, it's it's favored by chefs. One hundred percent natural salt. Whatever the frick that means. I I told you. I even oh, found, God. I found it's a, just rocks. It's article, just rocks. An article on livestrong.com. Gray salt versus Himalayan oh, pink God. salt. I mean, there's an entire, oh. this article is far too long. But it has opinions. It's not like actually it's just the same as the normal salt that you use. So, I mean, I know the diff. like, th- there's just more minerals in this other stuff. So if you just, so there's a lot of salts is, is what we, we call it an, any ionic compound in chemistry, we call a salt. And there's a lot of salts in seawater. And the most plentiful one is sodium chloride, which is what is in table salt. And when you, make table salt because you're like people want the thing that they want not a bunch of extra stuff mixed in because it's the 50s and we want to make things that are the things people want rather than like the most weird natural we're not even sure what's really in this which is apparently the (laughs) the craze right now you make it pure sodium chloride so they go through with some processes to make it pure sodium chloride and then they put a touch of iodine in so that people in america don't get goiters anymore and that's table salt uh, and it comes from mostly from mining salt, uh, but mine like when you mine salt, that also usually came from sea salt or from inland seas, uh, like the Great Salt Lake, where there were long periods of time where water was going to a place and then evaporating, and then that got covered up with rock, and then you dug it out. Uh, and they actually, interestingly, one of the ways that they do this is instead of digging it out with scoops, they'll pump hot water down, what? and then they'll pump the hot water out, and the hot water will come out with a bunch of salt in it, and then they evaporate off the water, and you get the salt. And then what's left behind is a giant hole in the earth where there is nothing because you've pumped all the salt out. And then sometimes, occasionally, and there's a video of this happening, it just collapses, what? and like all the trees on top are like zoop and just fall inside. There's a really great video of all the, like an entire swamp falling into one of these salt caves that they made pumping salt out of a place. I I don't know if I don't know if you can find it just by googling like salt cave tree falling <laughs> disaster or something. But salt it's cave good. disaster. Salt cave tree fall disaster. What do we get? Video. Got to type in video. Yeah, uh, yes, there, there's a video that comes up. There are video, but it's not the video I'm looking for. Really? Uh, the, yeah, Bayou, Bayou Corn Sinkhole Swallow Stands of Trees. <laughs> it's really good. It's it's like three minute long video, and the whole time you're like, what's happening? Are those trees really going to fall into just like, they're just going to keep falling? Oh, man. Uh, everybody look up the Bayou Corn Sinkhole, and oh, there, there they go. They're just, they're trees, and then they're just, where are they going? 
Where that's they're not falling over. They're just getting the weight. They're just going down, and then they're just gone. They get you. sucked away and the trees are gone now Goodbye. and the guys with the cameras just sitting there and i'm like how do you know that's not gonna happen under you right now right hank can i just i am so impressed by how much you know about salt i was not <laughs> not at all anticipating all of this but i feel like we really touched on something that you you feel personally very invested in right well i guess i i may have I may have uh, strong opinions about a number of things that I shouldn't have strong opinions on. It may be one of my uh, one of my vices. I uh, but I do feel so. And then when you make these other kinds of salt, are just the raw salt that hasn't had the other minerals, the other ionic compounds taken out of it, and uh, and so that has more stuff than just the salt in it. Which I don't like. Maybe some experts can taste the difference between those things. I don't think that you can because salt is a very strong flavor, and uh, and they are it is definitely not like healthier for you um if you want to get extra minerals it makes a lot more sense to just get those minerals rather than like loading it up inside of your food by making it saltier which has potential negative health effects right i mean in this this article that i'm still amazed that there are so many words to compare gray and and, and himalayan pink salt i mean they they do go into <laughs> nutritional profiles and differences in texture and use so i i would say uh so people do have strong uh, opinions about that i don't know if those are based out of science um you know what i want to i want the next salt trend that i want to see happen mm-hmm. i want everybody to just go to salt licks just just have a salt lick on your table. And yeah. just chisel off part of the salt lick and sprinkle that on top. No, 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 no. No, you got to gotta go straight to the source. You eat a bite of your food and then you lick the salt. Yeah. You eat a bite of your food and lick the salt. Yeah. Can we make that happen? And then everybody like everybody just passes the salt lick around. You're like, hey, can I get the, <laughs> the salt lick because I'm a freaking deer? Gross. I'm like I'm like an elk. Yeah. Yeah. I really feel it. I mean, why not? Right? Which is... <laughs> How weird can we make this? You know, I'm probably offended some chefs just now or just people who are really into their special salts, but um, I, in general, we had had a question that we didn't end up asking last week uh, from someone asking, um, I was told by my barista that I was going to, that she was going to make me the best coffee I'd ever had in my life. And I was like, I don't want that. Because then like all the other coffee won't be as good forever. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, kind of. Like, maybe I just don't want to know how much better the expensive salt is. Maybe I just want to keep using the salt that Kate, that costs, like, literally nothing. It's, like, basically free because of how much you can get for how low a price. Right. Maybe I don't want to know. Maybe I don't want to know, like, how much better a thing is. And, and when, honestly, like, it's probably not that much better. I just want the, I just want my coffee that I made in my house. Yeah. I mean, but, but, right. We're just feeding into this culture of always needing the the bigger, better, more delicious salt. I, I don't feel like that's sustainable for people today. Right. I think that's too much right. pressure. I get oh, that. Oh, God, it's so much pressure. How, like, do I have to choose what kind of salt I'm using? Right. Can't, I can't just, like, do I have to feel, like, weirdly bad about using normal salt? Yeah, because then you're going to have a dinner party, and then and then you're, you will... So you're, it's a scenario where you went to a dinner party at someone's house and they had Himalayan pink salt on the table and then you mm-hmm. invite that person over and then you realize that you, you uncultured, you, you know, the plebe, only have regular <laughs> table salt to offer your friend who has much more sophisticated taste than you do. And then, and then what do you do with that? Then you're going to feel self-conscious and oddly inferior for no reason. Other than this weird precedent that we've set that everybody needs to, if you can afford it, then have fancy table salt. Everything has to be fancy, which reminds me, Emily, of our sponsor this week, uh, which is Uncultured Plebe Salt. It's our new product. It's just salt. It's uh, it's like one cent more than the ex- regular salt that you can get from, like, the salt people. But our salt uh, is made by us. So, but it's called Uncultured Plebe Salt, and it's just... You could feel okay about using normal salt. Oh, geez. Uh, I think our other our other sponsor for today is Turducken Snakes. Uh, for when <laughs> one snake isn't enough, you need a snakeception. So get your Turducken Snakes. 
it snakes all the way down. Yes! We also have a Project for Awesome message from, uh, <laughs> we also have a Project for Awesome message from Rodri Ran uh, to Natalie. Gnatalie, sorry, Gnatalie, uh, who is her favorite sister. I miss living close. You should come visit. We have two pita pits in a 10 mile radius. I will even let you sleep in a bed that is definitely mine. We, whatever that means. If we have to share it, you can have the edge and I'll take off my socks. We can stay up late playing skip bow and boggle. It'll be like old times. Love your favorite sister. That sounds nice and sweet. Yeah, I feel like there were a lot of inside jokes in there that I didn't understand, but that is, yeah. but I, but I'm, but I'm for it. I'm for it. Would, is Skip Bo the one with the thing that goes on your foot? Yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah, I think I th so. It's a Skip Bo and Boggle are two very different kinds of games, I but I like that you've got both it's. physical and wait, no, Skip Bo is a, is a card game. It's like, uh, it's like Uno, but different. Oh. Yeah, because skippets yeah. are the things you put on your foot. Yeah, what happened to those? Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I They probably got recalled because I remember playing that with my sister. And if that thing flies off your foot, it's going 20 miles an hour right in the face of the second grader in the in the yard <laughs> one over. That's what happened to that. That's right. Oh, God. Uh, or people just started using them as weapons. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> oh, Emily, no. um, getting the deer with them to stop them from eating the tulips. Uh, we've got some news from Mars and AFC Wimbledon today. I think that the, the responsibility for both of those news has fallen on my shoulders today. Uh, and I have good Mars news and bad AFC Wimbledon news. Uh -oh. Emily, are you, are you like deeply curious about what I'm about to tell you? Yes. Let's start with the AFC Wimbledon news. Um, AFC Wimbledon now, I believe, I think, so they lost their game this week. They lost despite basically having a great opportunity to not uh, to not lose in that they had like seven corner kicks to the other team's one and they had the uh, most of the possession and they had most of the shots on goal and uh, and yet still in the 22nd minute of the game the only goal was scored the only goal was scored by the other team whoever they were Aww. and that that means that AFC Wimbledon is now I, th I think that it's the bottom five that gets relegated. I tried to Google this, but I wasn't good enough and fast enough to do it. And if, the, it, is, if it is the bottom five, then they are at the tippy top of the relegation zone, just above the, as John says, franchise currently applying its trade in Milton Keynes, whatever that means. Whoa. And, uh, and so it's possible that both... AFC Wimbledon and the the franchise will both end up getting relegated and will be playing in League Two once more together, and that would be a real bummer. But at least MK wouldn't stay up while AFC went down. So, but there is still time left. AFC Wimbledon needs to win games uh, by scoring goals, and if they can do that, <laughs> then they will be able to stay in League Two. Or league, they will be able to stay in League One and continue playing soccer uh, with better teams than are in League Two, and I maybe, I don't know, make more money somehow, and they, that will be that will be good for the team and the uh, fans. So they of the just team. they just have to be better. They just have to be good then. Just right. I think goals. that what would help is if they would score more goals and have fewer goals scored against them. Yeah, th that's kind of what I took from took away from that. Yeah, um, better defense and offense. Yes, better at playing the game. Good. Better soccer. Um, and we we also have our Mars news for. Today. I don't mean to mock AFC Wimbledon. I just that's all I that's all I can tell you. We uh, have a proposal out of NASA to design robotic bees, is what, what they're calling them, that can fly on Mars. What? They announced the project March 30th, so just uh, uh, you know, last week, and it is in its early stages, but the idea is to uh, replace rovers with a sort of station uh, that like stays in the same place. It's like a charging station and communication station, and the bees fly off, do stuff, fly back to the charging station, and then they recharge and they uh, can like d dump data or something and uh, or, or even samples maybe, and then 
go back off and fly around even more. And the uh, these things are little, so they would be like literally the the body part would be the size of a bee, Ooh. and then the wing part would be bigger than a bee's wings because there isn't a lot of atmosphere on Mars. Yeah, they got to fly. And they'd they'd fly around on Mars, uh, like yeah. Uh, doing doing weird science and this is very cool there are lots of places that like rovers can't get to easily and it's dangerous to take a rover into a place where the sand might get it stuck or it the the grade is too steep but a uh, flying thing wouldn't have as many of those problems and if even if it did land and then fall over maybe it could figure out how to get itself righted and back into the air again sure and uh, and also the sort sort of like there are there could be lots of them and so if like one stops working you got backups so, so this is actually a, an idea that uh that that nasa is floating and working on and trying to to engineer a lot around a little bit to see if maybe it's a potentially future mars mission i i have a i have a question okay so why why call them bees and not just flies um well so if Emily, I don't know if you know this, but people like bees because uh, they make honey and they prevent the world from starving to death. Uh-huh. And uh, flies are annoying and we kill them and we see them as uh, unsanitary maggot machines. I know. I just I was trying to get back to my point about about this <laughs> ridiculous bias that we have. We do. We do. Against flies. I'm just a, it's a recurring theme, not just in this podcast, but you know, in my life. You know Emily, talk to me when a fly makes something that I eat regularly. I, I, aren't fly? Aren't some flies pollinators? I believe they are. No, 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 no. I mean like delicious, sweet sugar sauce that I put in my coffee. Because mm. like that's magic. That, yeah. I mean, I don't think that flies vomit sh- sweeteners. That is true. Um. <laughs> but yeah, flies do lots of great work, and there are many different types of flies, that, and, and only some of them are the ones that end up in our homes or bite us. Oh man, a horsefly? I hate a horsefly. I cannot abide. They don't have very many friends. But to get back to, to the point, that is the, the, the Mars news, is that's cool. That, did you ever think that we'd live in a time where you're talking about sending tiny little fly bots or bee bots to, to Mars? Uh, no, I did not. And and like the, you know, the scope of curiosity in the Mars 2020 rover is so outside of the scope of rovers when I was, you know, first started getting excited about space exploration, um, that it's, it's kind of easy to be like, oh, a rover is a rover, but it's very different to have like this like thing that's the size of a dinner plate basically versus a thing that's the size of a car moving around and doing now over 2000 days of science on the surface of Mars uh, curiosity is the coolest it's and amazing. what a great what a great name for for it um, I'm surprised that that one had was available still right like they had that wasn't on the top five like back in the 60s right yeah, it's like, well, we're going to name these ones Spirit and Opportunity because we're saving curiosity for when we send, like, basically cars. Right. But <laughs> what, a, what an amazing time to be alive. Right. And you can also get whatever the frick kind of salt you want. I know. The, the, the world really is your oyster. Your salty, salty, pink Himalayan salty oyster. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Just... Emily, thank you for making a podcast with me today. Uh, what what did we learn? Do you remember? Um, I, I feel like we've been all over the place. I feel like we, we learned that it's okay to have your ashes spread in the ocean with a permit. Uh, I feel like it's okay to be the sort of person who just wants basic salt in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and we also learned that butterfly maggots are just caterpillars and also that emily has a favorite subreddit in which this guy is wearing connects armor (laughs) and it's real real good and i'm proud of him yeah i am too he's he's being the best version of himself and and i support it we support it thank you emily thanks hank uh 
And thank you, everyone, for listening. This podcast is edited by Nicholas Jenkins. It's produced by Rosiana Hals Rojas and Sheridan Gibson. Our head of community and communications is Victoria Bongiorno, who also runs our Patreon, which you can find at patreon.com slash dearhankandjohn. It has a number of opportunities, including you can listen to our dumb podcast where we uh, talk about people called This Week in Ryan's. And uh, and that money goes to support all of our shows that we make, uh, like SciShow and Crash Course and Healthcare Triage and Sexplanations, all that cool stuff. And if you like what we do here, you can check that out. You can also find things that we will post on that Patreon that uh, is available to everyone, whether you can support it or not. So thank you all very much. If you want to email us, you can do that at hankandjohn at gmail.com. And we are on Twitter at Hank Green and at John Green. And Emily is also on Twitter at M-E-E-H-M-E-E. Uh, Thank you, Emily, for joining us. And as they say in our hometown, don't forget to be awesome. awesome.